Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Significant. It is a an, an immense pleasure for me uh, to talk to Christina Forbrick today, the Cancier. Christina, thank you for being with us again. Thank you for having me. I am just so pleased to be here. Oh, uh, it's it's an honor talking to you and significant uh our listeners know or we like to share stories from from people in different parts of the world in different communities and uh talk about you know how we came to the plant and what role cannabis plays in our lives and how it's changed us for the better so if we can get right to it um what was your, your first uh contact if you will with the cannabis plant oh first contact <laughs> i remember it very well uh, i was 15 and um a freshman in high school and my friend Colleen, who I'm still friends with, um, asked me to go home with her on her bus. And I was like, okay, let's go. So we go to her house. There's no parents there, but her brother's there. Shad, sorry, I'm calling them out. Nice. <laughs> um, and he had some weed. And he's like, you guys want to smoke some weed? He's like three, four years older than us. And we were like, whoa, I don't know what's this, you know? Right. And we are like, sure. And so we did. And we listened to D light. We played with her cats and we had like the best afternoon ever. Nice. And then I remember my mom picking me up and I go in home like, Oh my God, I just got high for the first time. Like it was this huge, like in my mind, I'm thinking I just experienced this huge leap of life, you know, I'm right. like so excited, you know, and, I got home and I just remember just feeling really happy about it. <laughs> and then I was like, well, how do I get more of that? You know? And so then, you know, it was more of like a recreational sneak off of campus at high school and go under the bridge and smoke with my friends uh -huh. just, just to get high. Um, then I started realizing how much it was helping uh, before I go to parties, I'd feel because I would get so anxious about and worried and insecure about what I was wearing and who I would see at the party and what I was going to do when I got there. And I'd sweat my pits out. And I figure I, I started, you know, I'd smoke a little pot and I was so much more calm and could like, like socialize. So I started to figure that out. And then every month when I have my period, I have horrible cramps and feel like crap. And herb helped. I felt better. So I started realizing like, oh, I don't think I really mentally put it together. Like this is a medicinal herb and a recreational herb. These are two different things. I just kind of was like, it's really aiding my life. And as a teenager, I was in a pretty chaotic household, single mom, who's definitely having trouble. And, um, oldest of you know my my brother and I we were latchkey kids home alone a lot and um it was something that I then kind of shared with my little brother and we also became friends so it and we were like mortal enemies before then and I was like I'm gonna get you high and yeah. so in our backyard I got him high and now we are best friends not that we did that life and a lot of stuff happening to that. And we are very close, but I will say that that helped, um, you know, with a, a, a kind of rough little relationship. And I started to also find that I could also be a really productive person. You know, I had come out of that dare situation. And I remember as a kid, I don't know if you had the same situation, but at the dare officer brought in a clear box with little compartments. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. With yeah. real drugs in them. Uh, yes. Right. Front and center. Yeah. yeah you remember were. that? And I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. You know, I remember seeing it and there was a little bit of funky ass boof in there. weed, and then all of it was crazy ass illicit drugs. Like, yeah. I can't imagine they would do that now. Like bring that in. No, no. Oh. I remember looking at that thing and saying, what's the end game here? We and he was like bringing it around, showing it like, I remember this. So as I was realizing, oh, it's, I can be productive. I, I super good grades in high school. I played three sports a year, social, doing all the things and also smoked weed. But I hid it because a lot of people thought it made you dumb. They'd say like, oh, you're a stoner, yeah. you know, and yeah. they'd give you that kind of like burnout kind of situation. Look, and, you know, it was still very destigmatized but or stigmatized rather then in 1996 
um, I was still in high school and uh, Prop 215 passed okay. in California, which uh, legalized medical marijuana. And I immediately was like, wait, okay, that makes sense. And I remember, you know, I'm a voracious reader, a researcher in my essence, but also in my training. So as a kid, I was reading anything I could find, which were like weird, illicit uh, underground magazines. Mm -hmm. And I remember learning the name Dennis Perone and then learning about all these activists who had been at it for a really long time. And, um, and I thought, God, this is really, okay, this is different for me. Like, this is a little different. And from that point forward, I definitely um, became more of a citizen scientist about cannabis. And as in my circle of friends and in my family, I kind of became that like de facto weed coach Yeah, because I was a nerd about it, a stone nerd. You know, <laughs> I was really like, I love it. And it's, a healing plant and we grew it in the nation when we stole it from the people who lived here. Absolutely. <laughs> so it was like, I was, and then reading about prohibition and what happened when alcohol prohibition ended and this Anslinger dude being out of a oh. job and having to justify what he was doing and connecting with the pharmaceutical companies and changing the word to marijuana. Like, right this is why I'm a sociologist, right? Also, yeah. I went to college and I studied sociology and the whole time I was smoking a ton of weed just to be like, I'm going to show you motherfuckers that I can do really great things, super intellectual, and I can still smoke it, weed. It's so cool. And so that's kind of how it, it was just like a huge passion of mine um, I guess underground for a while. Well, it, it obviously spoke to something that was, you know, that resonated with you. I love that. I love the groove and uh, the, the delight illusion there too, that you came home wanting to feel that way again. Groove was in your heart. I take it. it really was. <laughs> but I, I think you bring up something so important. And one of the reasons I, I, I love uh, being able to talk with you today, you know, you brought up Anslinger and we didn't see that at word marijuana before that guy, uh, where we can find the old ads, we can see cannabis oil in old school mm -hmm. remedies and whatnot. All pharmacies. Yeah, exactly. And then here comes this term marijuana. And anytime we get a term, uh, stoner, pothead or something, once you apply that label, oh, in our culture, we can discount that person's humanity. We can just write them off as that label or that label. I love that, that we have a cannabis educator and an advocate here. Uh, for our listeners to, to really gain some insight. You shared something with us uh, via your blog, which I want everyone to go to thecancer.com and, and, and check out Christina's work because it's, it's incredible. You were talking about the way that you use cannabis as a mom and daily lifestyle. You obviously, we've talked before and infused about your, the way you work with your clients. I, I wanted to share something from Christina's blog where she wrote, most importantly, cannabis is a tool for social change. For too long, black and brown bodies have been incarcerated for the same thing I do regularly in public without an ounce of fear, none period, zero period. If cannabis uh, can be a tool for social change, Christina, how, how do you want to see us wield that? What can we be doing? Oh, God, there's so much. I mean, it's... <laughs> So as soon as we start to recognize that the simple criminalization of cannabis has led to a, the wealth gap between men and women, but more, more uh, succinctly, it's even worse for black women and brown women. Just the cannabis criminalization alone has been a huge, catalyst in making that the way it is today. I mean, I believe white women make 80 cents on the dollar of a, of a white male. And I think black women made like 72 cents. So it's realizing that just the criminalization of that alone has contributed to that huge issue that we are now grappling with as, as we're trying to equitably distribute wealth to our nation. And to, um, you know, I mean, it's a reparative thing too. 
you know, as we're doing these initiatives in our states, we should be giving uh, people who have been victimized by the war on drugs, which is a war on people, we should be giving those folks first um, first stab at anything they want to be doing, you know, and uh, like the city planning meeting I was in, you know, they were like, well, we got to just shut down all these trap shops. And I said, you could also help them get legal. Yeah. You could also help them get legal, but they aren't hearing that. So there's, um, I mean, like it alone, it will, if, if we do it in a socially equitable way that really says, look, Black people are four times as likely to be incarcerated for a nonviolent cannabis offense than than a white person. Like, let's just let's just right. accept this truth. So, I think getting to accept the truth is our. I mean, that is mm-hmm. a huge problem. I don't know, and I have a lot of cautious optimism because of things like what. Dr. Jessica Knox is doing in Oregon for their um, initiative. Um, She was just posting, I just saw something about it yesterday. It sounds like something that um, will put uh, black and indigenous people of color at the forefront of this industry in um, an equitable and fair way. And it's something that could be scaled to other communities. So, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big, pro- this, it's actually just another cog in the American capitalist machine, but this one has hundreds of medicinal therapeutic yeah, uses. Yeah. And it's really, it can't be treated the same as alcohol. It can't be treated the same as mm-hmm. pharmaceuticals and trying to place that template on it is probably yeah. never going to work. So we have to really change policy and actually after being kind of like shut down in this city planning meeting, but then board members are yielding their time back to me. I was like, Oh, Oh, I do have something to say here. (laughs) What it told me is I don't want to be a politician by any stretch, but I do want to influence policy because if we are not baking equity in it's it's just never going to be good. It's just going to continue to be, 33% 33% taxes and people who have been growing for years are not ever able to get a license because of the regulations and the horrible expense in I'm there. I'm amazed, Christina, yeah. at, at people that are, you know, they it's their role, you know, they, at least they say, to legislate. I'm always amazed at how little... Uh, they understand about what they're legislating. And it, it gives me pause when we see these new markets that are about to open up. And I take, you know, Jersey because it's so close to yeah. where I am. Yeah. Um, it just, I have so many concerns that will rush out of the gate without taking care of the, the problems that have been with us for decades um, and the, the surrounding racial inequality. It's, it's a huge concern. Um, and, it's- and at this point, we have a lot of states to look to that have made mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's a little less leeway to make these big fuck ups. Mm -hmm. You know, in Jersey, they're surrounded. They can ask California, they can ask Colorado, they can ask Oregon. Yo, what didn't work? What did? It's, you know, there are ways to do this. And I came from, I come from progressive public education where we were in a place where if you're not asking for help, you're not doing it right. And until people come to that sense where like, you don't know everything, ask for help when you need it and listen to other people's perspectives. You know, Um, I think it's gonna take a lot of us as Americans getting on the same page as as far as truth. Because when when I'm talked down in a meeting because what I said is medicine, um, you know, they're saying leads to murders and and (sighs) death. So, there's clearly a big disconnect and it's generational and socioeconomic and all of those things. But, um, you know, I, I do find solace in the fact that most Americans, you know, not looking at our leaders, most American people mm-hmm. don't find yeah. me defensive. You know, most people are like, well, I don't, I don't, if they don't use it, they don't care. They're like, I don't care if I don't use it, but you should like, I don't care. And I feel that that is 
you know, if we're at 75 percent of Americans, somewhere close to that, I think that's a great Huge. thing. And Jersey, what is that? The 20, 25th or 26th yeah, it's state? 26th, like, I think. Really? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. I mean, like that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's a lot. Yeah. Um. So it's really hard for for people to continue on this prohibition state. You know, I mean, like they're missing out on so much, and the fact that this plant can like clean soil. Yeah. And and make stuff and heal bodies. It's just something that, you know, the way we've vilified it is, you know, we kind of don't deserve her. Anymore. It, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. It, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It, it, there's, there's so much to undo uh, and so much damage that, that, that the people that came before us did. But I, I do, I do share your optimism when I, when I think about, you know, the, the number of people that accept it now is a normal thing. Um, and, and the way that so many people have come around, especially in particular people that aren't, that don't, uh, use it, but are just yeah. like, you know, it's, it's your thing. Some people drink, I don't drink, you know, it, it, it's, yeah. yeah. So I, I am, and, and I do think that you're right as far as we need to embrace the truth and, and have that discussion. That, that tends to be a difficult discussion though, right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, What's the proof, right? yeah. And I, I think I had this thing where I'm, I'm really at the point where I'm like, no, no, no. Some people, sometimes they just need to be told, well, that's just incorrect and accept it. But that's a whole yeah. nother. <laughs> yeah, that's a little tough these days. That's a little hard. That's a little well, hard. Uh, when you, um, I was uh, reading about when you work with clients and you said, you know, you, your goals are always, you know, uh, don't get overwhelmed. Uh, and, and, and please know that there's information and education that's out there and readily available. And you're such a, uh, a bright spot for that with what you provide, uh, online. And when you come and do stuff like this and, and, and join us, we, we end up learning something all the time. Thank you for your time today, Christina. I'm such a fan and, and I, I, I'm so, uh, humbled by you being here today. Thank you so much. I am humbled by being here. This is just a really enjoyable conversation, a real delight. I'm so happy that we're seeing each other also. It's just such oh. a nice thing. And I really appreciate oh. you asking me to be here. Thank Christina you very much. Christina Forbrick, the Cancier, our guest today on Significant. We're going to see you next time from Delahue, Delaware. Bye-bye now.